Uh, I'd like to just take uh, an opportunity to uh, thank a couple of people who were in, uh, really uh, vital in organizing our panel today. One of them is uh, Mark Mills from our Department of uh, Mass Communications, helping in coordinating a lot of the activities that we needed to have this event going on. And the other is Andy Dawkins, who's one of our panelists, and uh, you'll get to meet him in a, in a few moments. So again, uh, keep your questions handy because we'll be getting, them, getting to them quickly. If you are a student taking this for credit, we do encourage you to uh, sign up. You can do it after you're, as you're leaving. There's a, a legal pad out on the table outside uh, where you can go and put your name down. And we also would like you to put down the class that you are hoping that this is for credit. And so uh, we can get that to the professor to make sure that you are um, uh, your, your credit is counted. We're also recording the event today, so we're hoping to get that up on, on YouTube very soon as well. So if you want to relive it, uh, you will be able to do that as well if everything technologically goes okay. We're going to start off our program uh, with uh, uh, Jim Cottrell from the Department of uh, Political Science. He's going to talk to us about, kind of give us some historical background about how we've come to our political system today, which is mostly dominated by a two-party system. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, everybody coming and showing up. Um, it's an exciting time in American politics. We have uh, obviously an election this year and uh, there's been no shortage of drama. Uh, what you don't see though and what you'll see today is uh, more of the diversity of parties that we have in the United States. And um, so what Dale asked me to talk about today was a little bit of history to talk about how did we arrive at a system where we have two dominant parties and why do we have, uh, why is there so much difficulty and struggle for other parties to actually try to uh, succeed in our system. Now one thing that's interesting and most so you may be aware is that the framers of the Constitution uh, were very suspicious of parties to the point that they really spoke out against them. James Madison was not a fan of parties. He described them as factions that would divide us. If you look at Congress today, you would probably, he's probably shaken his head in his grave saying, see, this is what I told you would happen. Um, and so how did we end up with a system today where we have two parties that basically control the government uh, that really dominate elections? And uh, there's two primary explanations. And I apologize to those students who've actually heard this in my class, but we're going to go through this a little bit again. Maybe it'll help you on the final exam. Um, so there's two principal explanations. Uh, one of them is, is sort of a historical, traditional uh, explanation. If you think about the two parties and the origins of our two major parties, they really stemmed out of that constitution debate. Uh, the debate over the Constitution in 1787 was between the Federalists who wanted to have a stronger central government that was effective, uh, that was able to do things, but had enough checks and balances to, to sort of protect liberty. Before we had our current Constitution, we were a confederation, uh, which was extremely weak. It was ineffective. It didn't work. And so the principal debate in the Constitution was, do we want to ratify this Constitution that gives a lot of power to the central government, even with the checks and balances? And there were none, the, 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 those were the Federalists, the ones that wanted to create this federal system of government. And so they would probably roughly correspond to the Democratic Party today but that believes in a stronger, active uh, government and believes that the central government has some responsibilities. And uh, the, the anti-Federalists were the other side that believed more in states' rights and they had um, uh, suspicion of centralized power, suspicion of centralized government. And so the anti-Federalists would more closely correspond to uh, the Republican Party and the idea that you want a smaller government and give more power to the state governments. So that's kind of the traditional explanation. Um, but there's a more powerful explanation that is actually probably the reason that we have two dominant parties today. Look at the disgust that voters have with the two major parties today, and you might scratch your head and say, why do they keep voting for these two parties? Part of it is because of the electoral rules that we have. There's something called Duverger's Law. There's this mathematician that's described a system, an electoral system like we have, winner take all with uh, single member districts for our congressional seats. When you have that winner take all system, you are inevitably going to favor two dominant parties because in order to win, you've got to uh, be able to get the majority. Uh, and, and it's very hard if you're a new party, if you're trying to get off the ground, it really usually comes down to the two dominant, the two strongest parties. Now. Countries that have proportional representation, countries like in Europe that have different electoral rules, you see the result. Okay, they have a vibrant multi-party system. You have the Green Party, Labor Party, Conservative Party, you have all these other parties, and they will get some seats in the parliament. 
So even if the Jim Cottrell party got 1% of the vote, they might get one seat. And so you'd actually have a voice, that party would have uh, a, a role to participate in that debate. So more than anything, the electoral rules that we have in our system are always going to favor a two-party system. Now there's some consequences to that. Um, if you think about our two parties, they cover a lot of ground ideologically, and we don't have what are called responsible parties in American government. Members of the party can vote against their own party leadership. Okay, why do you think John Boehner resigned at the end of, uh, of last year? He was frustrated because his people in his own party wouldn't even listen to him. He couldn't get them uh, to go along. So in European countries, if you don't go along with the party, you can be kicked off uh, the list and basically you're going to be out of work. So the rules have a lot to do with it. And I think some of the people here today are going to talk a little bit about the rules. How could we maybe change those? Particularly at the local level, there's communities that have experimented with uh, other types of voting. I, I came from the San Francisco Bay Area a year and a half ago, and they adopted sort of a rank ordering system in some of their uh, uh, citywide elections, and that actually uh, changes is the dynamic a little bit and uh, uh, there are you know possibly more radical changes that we could consider that would actually give us more choices but think about parties in the United States today we only have two parties but think about a party that can have people like um, Susan Collins of Maine along with Ted Cruz of Texas on very different ideological strains and then an oddball like Donald Trump who seems to encapsulate almost no kind of you know, I mean, he's just all over the place. And, um, you know, it, it's really odd to people in other countries to see that all of these people call themselves Republican. And then on the Democratic side, you've got someone who's a, an avowed socialist who's running against Hillary Clinton, and these are both in the same party, too. When you only have two parties, they have to try to cover a lot of ground. And it's going to be harder for the voters to make sense. Well, what is this party all about? There's a lot of Republicans right now that are scratching their head and saying, what does Trump stand for? How does he reflect you know, Republican values. So um, that's the confusing part. It makes it a little more difficult to sort of pin down, what does this party stand for? And when the voter goes in the voting booth, what is this party all about? Uh, in the United States, it's hard to do that because our electoral rules are going to lead us to have only two parties and they're going to cover a lot of ground. So one of the things to listen for today is kind of the diversity of, of what do these parties represent? What are the things that they want to do? And, um, and what do they think would actually help you know, to make the system a little bit more uh, vibrant and a little more competitive, I think, for third parties. So um, with that said, um, hopefully that gives you a sense for why we have two parties and where we've arrived at today. I don't want to take up too much time. I want to give these people a chance to talk to you. So let me open the floor here and, and bring up uh, Mr. Dawkins. So I think he's up next. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm not sure I can get this mic to work, but okay. um, I'll just start right over here. <clears throat> so uh, that was a great lead-in and informative, and uh, thanks to St. Cloud for having us. I'm Andy Dawkins, and I'm uh, an occasional Democrat. I voted for Bernie two days ago. I'm uh, full-time Green, and we got the Green Party here. I have quite a libertarian streak, and I'm definitely for legalizing it. So um, it uh, it's really why we're here today is talking about why we need more political choices than just the same old Democrats and the same old Republicans. Why? Because we've got a stalemated, we've got a polarized two-party system that cares more about the next election and getting reelected than they care about governing. Okay? We, we, why we need to break up the two-party duopoly is because it's just a really small number of political elites that are making all of the decisions and choices and their only power comes from being the only two choices that are out there. That's the only power they really have. So we need to break that up. I don't believe that this country, that all of us in America, are as polarized as the media makes out. I think that we have a commonality of values, of aspirations, and we just need to get more choices out there so that people can, can really see the reflection of this entire country. There's too many people that are disengaged and don't see any reason to get out there and vote. So why do we need uh, uh, to break up this two-party system? Well, Bernie Sanders got an almost two-to-one victory over Hillary Clinton the other night, but when you add in the superdelegates, the political elite, it came out as a tie in Minnesota for uh, what the national delegates are going to say about who should be the presidential candidate. It's a fact that 150 families 
in this country outspend the entire rest of the population on political campaigns. So it really is a small number that's doing this. It reminds me of something I read somewhere that uh, it's like a, a, a game that uh, there's an endless game between two teams with very few fans in the stands, but they don't allow third parties onto the field. So why do we need to break up the system that we've got? It's, it's a rigged system. It's a, a system that doesn't really give people the choices they need. And I think that the most important point I want to make is that they control the marketplace. There's no other place to shop. But you know, the folks are angry out there about all this, and I think that uh, that's the opportunity that we all have right now. Witness the votes that are out there for Sanders and for Trump right now. They're coming as anti-establishment candidates, and I think that's what we need to tap. And if we can do that, uh, democracy by definition is self-correcting, and that's us. That's having choices, more than just the two-party system. More places to shop. So, you know, um, if we could talk with one voice, and that's what all of us minor parties in Minnesota have come together united about. I'll talk about that in a minute. But if we could come together with one voice for electoral reform to change some of the rules, if we would not vote for candidates who weren't willing to be reformers, we could end the two-party restraint on free speech, and we could end the media restraint on an informed electorate. We have a concrete suggestion of the way to do this. It's called ranked choice voting, statewide ranked choice voting. This is something very concrete that I'd like everybody to get a handle on before you leave today. So I ran for attorney general as the Green Party candidate in 2014, two years ago. And I don't know, and Chris Stock, where's Chris? There's Chris. He ran as the lieutenant governor candidate for the Libertarian Party. And Hannah Nicollet, right there next to Chris, ran as the gubernatorial candidate on the Independence Party. We've got Zach Phelps, who ran for Golden Valley City Council, just uh, uh, as a legalized uh, candidate. State Senate. Uh, State Senate. No, no, right. Andy Schuler Andy. ran for, and Zach Phelps ran for state legislature. State Senate. State Senate. Okay, there we go. So you've got some folks who have tried to do this, all right? And we've all run into the problem of two parties kind of controlling what happens out there. In my particular race, I was told, you know, I was a Democrat in the legislature for 15 years. And I was a fairly popular legislator. And I had a lot of Democrats out there who really wanted to vote for me. But they said, Andy, if I vote for you for Attorney General as the Green Party candidate, the Republican might win. And that's the problem we need to talk about here today. It, um, it, it was just so many times, I had to vote for Lori Swanson. She was the DFL incumbent. I just had to, Andy, because otherwise, it would give the Republicans a chance to win the attorney general seat. And I'm sure that Chris and Hannah heard that same thing from the Republicans, that, yeah. That, Everyone's out there, and ranked choice voting changes all that. So let me tell you how, in a sample, how it would work. Let's assume three candidates. Me and uh, Lori Swanson, the incumbent, and uh, there was a guy named uh, Scott Newman who was running as the Republican. And if everyone went and voted their first and second and third choice for that, there would have been a lot of people maybe that voted uh, more than the 2% the I got that voted for me. So I had 6% of the votes. And Lori, the Democrat, had 48%. And Scott, the Republican, had 46%. Adds up to 100%. But nobody got to 50% plus one. So there's not a winner yet. Since I was in last place with 6%, I get dropped off. But then you go look at the ballots that were cast for me, and you see who was that voter's second choice if I'm no longer in the race. And so the Democrats that were out there wouldn't have had to say, I'm worried about electing the Republican because if Andy's not going to win, then I got my second choice that's still being considered. And that way, you know, the most important thing is that all of you, all of us in Minnesota, can start to vote for our ideals instead of just having to be satisfied with the same old, same old two-party system. So um, just to conclude real quick here, it, I really think that even though there's not enough students in the room today, to really catch, have this catch fire. If you go forth and start talking a little bit about we don't have to do the same old two-party system, we got a chance to catch fire. And I want you to know about all of us that we're united on three things. We're united on com a belief that we have to combat the sense that nothing ever changes. 
We all agree on that, right? We got to combat that. With Second thing we all agree on is that we need to have electoral reform in the state of Minnesota, something like the ranked choice voting that I just talked about. And the third thing we agree on, all of us, is that once we have more choices, once we have real choices, once we have an increased engaged electorate, more people wanting to vote and pay attention, that we'll trust the electorate to make the decisions about should we have more or less government regulation, more or less socialism, more or less guns, more or less arrests for small amounts of marijuana. Once there's enough people voting, we all are willing to trust what the electorate's willing to do with all of that. So I think what you're looking at on the stage here and looking at yourselves a little bit and thinking about the larger community out there that you come from, that we could be, if we can stay united on those things, we could be looking at the next most powerful movement in politics in Minnesota. We got to start somewhere. We're starting at St. Cloud. We want to get to other college campuses for November. And if you want to join us, we need you. And go third parties. So I'll turn it over to have each of the parties take about five minutes talk about what their values are and why they'd like to have you think about voting for them. So maybe, Chris Dock, you want to go first and talk about that? And well, you can do it from your, yeah, I think it's work here. Okay. Thanks. Am I live here? You guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Chris Dock. I'm the state chair for the Libertarian Party of Minnesota. Um, as you can tell by our name, our key premise is liberty. Um, we actually believe in what the founding fathers of the country believed in, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We believe in individual liberties and less government interference in your life. Uh, if I had to encapsulate our party in three words, it would be liberty, equality, and peace. So liberty means freedom to do whatever you feel is best for yourself, as long as you're not hurting or infringing upon the rights of another person. Uh, so that's in your personal life, that's with your finances, that's what you put in your body, your business. Uh, equality means that those rules apply to everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, black or white, gay or straight, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, atheist, it doesn't matter. People are people and every human being deserves the liberty and the rights of every other human being. Uh, and then peace, which is peace between people and peace between countries. So uh, we don't believe that our military should be invading, occupying, and nation building across the world. Uh, we believe that we should defend ourselves. Our mascot or animal representation, if you will, is, is a porcupine. And people ask me, you know, why, why a porcupine? Porcupines don't attack. They defend themselves, and they'll defend themselves very strongly, uh, very painfully to their attacker, but they have never attacked another animal or human. So. Um, you know, we're thrilled to be part of this third party coalition. Obviously, we have some differences of opinion on different issues. That's why we have separate parties, but we really believe in a lot of the same things. And one of the things that I really respect of everybody on this stage is they're trying to make the world a better place. They're not trying to build a machine that they can gain power and influence and money through. Everybody's just trying to look at the vision of how they think the world should be better and, and pursue that. Uh, we don't think that's how the Democrats and Republicans operate. Uh, they're all about getting into power and then retaining power and then handing out the favors that go along with that power. So the money, the influence, the favors, the special treatment, that's what the two big parties are peddling. And nobody on this stage does that, which I really respect. Again, we have two major parties right now. We need more voices. And as Annie mentioned, the success of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, whether you love them or hate them, they represent a pushback on the establishment of the Democrat and Republican parties saying, here's who's next. So Hillary Clinton was kind of anointed as she's next. Bernie Sanders tipped the tables on her and said, no, I don't believe in that. I want to talk about what people really want and need. Same thing with Donald Trump. You can love him or hate him, but the Republican Party does not want him to be succeeding the way he did. And he said, I don't care. I'm going to speak my voice. So while we have very strong disagreements on things with those people, uh, I think that shows a sentiment that people are ready for more options. And it's not just adding a third party to the selection. It's seven parties. It's nine parties. It's how many, however many parties it takes so the people's opinions can be uh, represented. As far as in the uh, media, so we had a, a presidential candidate in 2012, Gary Johnson. How many of you ever heard of him? All right, so not a lot of hands in the audience, a couple. Uh, he, you know, he was on the ballot in all the states. He was a, a viable presidential candidate, um, two-term governor of New Mexico, libertarian, and he was excluded from the debates. He was excluded from the polls. And people in general, if they don't hear the name, if they don't get exposed to the person, he had no chance. So as great as you might think his ideas are, uh, you, the majority of people have never heard of him. So that's something that's a problem. There's a lawsuit open right now that says if you're on the ballot, whether you're libertarian, green, independent, you know, grassroots party, it doesn't matter. If you're on the ballot, you should be included in the debates and the polls. 
Uh, our main issues, I'll just run down them quickly. First of all, we want to put an end to the war on drugs. It's, it's insane. We spend 20, uh, sorry, $50 billion a year on drug enforcement, a trillion dollars so far. We put nonviolent people in prison, and then we let murderers and rapists Murderers and rapists out early because our prisons are full. Well, if we stopped putting nonviolent people in prison, we'd have a less of a problem with that. Um, also, there's inequality in the enforcement of that. So uh, a minority is eight to, ten, eight to ten times more likely to go to prison for a drug offense than a white person. You shouldn't get different justice based on the color of your skin or the power of the attorney that you can hire. Uh, we also believe that the tax code is flawed. It's 70,000 pages long, and it's not just that it's complex. Every page was written and bought for by some special interest. Every special treatment that's in the tax code was put in there so that somebody can benefit from it. So as convoluted as it is to do your taxes, every stupid question that you see when you do it is because somebody is benefiting from how they bought that into the system. We also believe that educational dollars should follow the student and not the system. So we believe that parents should have the right to choose what's best for their own children as far as the school they go to. And if you don't like the school where you're located, we do have open enrollment, but that's like saying if you don't like McDonald's, you can go to the McDonald's McDonald's two miles down the road. True choice would be if you don't like McDonald's, go to Burger King, Wendy's, Subway, whatever. It shouldn't be up to the government to decide where you have to send your kids to school. And all it hurts is the people who can't afford private schools. So the rich can send their kids to every, any school that they want to. If you look at all the people in Congress in Washington, D.C., all of their children go to private school because the schools there aren't up to the standards that they want. Well, why is that that the people who can't afford to relocate their children to a different school have to be the ones to suffer? Uh, and so again, it, it kind of comes down to money is running the system. And we look at the Democrats and the Republicans, it's like watching professional wrestling. They want us to think that they hate each other and they're fighting each other. It's a show. They're really on the same side. It, it's two heads on the same beast. It's money, it's influence, it's power, and it's not about what's best for the people. Um, as Andy mentioned, we're uh, supporters of ranked choice voting. It gives you more options. I had very dear personal friends of mine when I ran for the lieutenant governor that said, I love you, I believe everything you say, I'm not voting for you because you can't win, so I'm gonna vote for Mark Dayton because I hate Jeff Johnson, or I'm gonna vote for Jeff Johnson because I hate Mark Dayton. Um, I can't even get my own friends to vote for me because they're afraid of what's gonna happen. So it, you just can never, like Andy said, you can never get over that hurdle. Um, you know, spending is out of control. We've got an 18 to 19 trillion dollar debt. We've got 90 trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities. That's gonna blow up. I hope that I'm dead when it blows up. It's gonna blow up sometime in your lifetimes. So everything that gets handed down the road, you guys are inheriting and it's just becoming a bigger and bigger mess. Um, and in summary, you know, we believe in government. You hear government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, we have government of the people. We are governed. We have government by the people a select few. I mean, it's really the elite that run the shots. We want government for the people, which means all of your voices matter. Everything that you feel should be heard. And if you think that somebody in Washington is listening to you right now, it's just not going to happen. So that needs to change. Thank you. Hi. So as Andy said, I am Hannah Nicolet. I was the Independence Party candidate for governor in 2014. And we are, the Independence Party is a pretty big tent, but if I were to say there's a uniform, unifying factor among us, it is that we believe in being independent, so political independence. We believe in not being not being beholden to special interests. So that is the unifying factor, although I agree with a lot of what Chris had to say as far as individu individual uh, individual issues. But as far as the, the issue of our electoral process goes, and that is the main reason why we end up stuck with what we do. I mean, it's a control issue. The Republicans and Democrats, they want to keep it this way. 58%, according to Gallup, 58% of Americans do not feel adequately represented by the Republicans or the Democrats. And, and yet, what do we keep getting, Republicans and Democrats? And so what we see is these major parties that are really, when you see what, what the people want, I mean, let's, most people want marijuana legalization. Why can't we have it? We, why do we have people in jail for doing things that our last three presidents have all admitted to doing? If we have equal protection under the law, why are our last three presidents not being charged with something? So we have a situation where we have these two parties that are worshiping special interests, and they will continue to put forward candidates, because here's the thing, I believe that if we change the electoral process, we will see the Republicans and Democrats, they will have to put forward better candidates. They wouldn't be able to get away 
with Hillary Clinton. They wouldn't be able to get away with putting someone like that forward that nobody actually wants because the elite wouldn't be running the show. They would be forced to put forward candidates who actually respect what people want. And so they've been, they've been benefiting from this system by strategic voting. So strategic voting is that I feel like what we've always talked about, the lesser of evils voting, that because I'm afraid of candidate A, I have to vote for candidate B, who I also don't like. So I've got my choice between a turd sandwich and a vomit burrito, but I've got no choice and I decide, well, a vomit burrito sounds a little better today, so that's what I go with. And they know that they can do that. They know, actually, Mitt Romney, so you know, going back in election, Mitt Romney was chosen before the whole thing started. And I, I know this, I was actually close to, my husband was a delegate to the RNC, so I got to see it firsthand. That whole thing was a charade. Mitt Romney was chosen before it started, and then they go through this dog and pony show and pretend as though the people chose Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney didn't have a huge following. He didn't draw crowds. People didn't like to listen to him. He was not the people's choice. If you want to know who the people's choice was among the Republicans, it was Ron Paul. He's the one who drew a crowd. But regardless, the, the the parties wouldn't be able to get away with this stuff if we had a different process because the data shows that when people feel that they have a choice, so as in ranked choice voting is one, one opportunity, there are other alternative methods, instant runoff, but we have an awesome, awesome group of people, of activists here in the state of Minnesota who've made tons of headway. They represent Fair Vote, if you've ever heard of that organization. They have a great boots on the ground organization and they've made a lot of headway getting ranked choice voting here in Minnesota. And we've had it in some local elections and I would like to see it on a statewide election. Actually, I'd like to see it nationwide where people like in Australia and other parts of the world where other views are represented. And really, we don't actually, you know, there's the, the general terms about Republicans and Democrats being what they stand for, but they don't really stand for it. When, when the road, the Republicans and Democrats both stand for endless war, corporate bailouts, they both stand for these, you know, the central banking, they both stand for really all the same basic things. Nothing ever changes. And there's a reason for that because it's really an elite group of people that are running this show. And so that if we want to beat them, the way to beat them is to have a different style. Alternative voting scares the hell out of them. And that's what we ought to have. Well, I guess I'd just first like to thank all of you for being here today. And I'd like to thank anybody who showed up on Super Tuesday to caucus, especially for Bernie Sanders. Um, so I guess I'll start off with my name. I'm, my name is Zach Phelps. I'm 24 years old. I'm an activist. I'm an advocate. And I'm a biker. Um, I'll start off with a little bit about my party. So I'm with the League of Marijuana Now Party. I started with them actually just this last December, and we went to February 9th. I ran for state senator in District 35, so up in like Ramsey, Anoka, Andover area. Uh, it's a very red area, so especially for a third party candidate going to legalize cannabis, it's, you know, we have the cards stacked against us, and I guess that's a little bit about what I'd like to talk to you today. So as a third party candidate, you start your race with the cards stacked against you. If you want to do this as a young person, I want you to know, I'm telling you today, you have the power to do that. Every one of you. But you have to want it. When I started my race, we had to get 500 signatures, pen to paper, in one week. Where, where the candidates, Republican and Democrat, all you need to do is pay a filing fee of $100 and sign a piece of paper. So, you know, in that sense, we needed to try very hard. We needed to push 500 people in one week to you know, get out and say we want it legalized. So we were going door to door, we were going inside and outside of apartments and doing everything that we can in order to get those signatures, which we ended up doing and we got 900, so we did get put on the ballot. Um, the fact that that's something that you know, we have to do I find is very unfortunate, but you know, it is how it is, so I mean, you do have to want it. So I wanna talk to you a little bit about voter apathy in the United States and in Minnesota. I think it's a huge problem that we have. Out of 70,000 people in my district, we only had 4,000 come out to vote in total. I myself only achieved 180 of those votes. So even our Republican senator that was elected, he only got 3,800 votes. So what that tells me is out of 70,000 people, only 4,000 wanted to come out and speak their mind and use their vote. And that's something that we need to change here in America. I, you know, a Andy mentioned the media and how the, the media affects third parties here in America. It's not just the news media, it's media in general. 
raise of hands, how many people here like superheroes? Batman, Superman, The Flash is my guy, okay? <laughs> so we grew up as millennials watching superheroes, watching our guy swoop in and save the day. But while he was doing that, we got to see all of the regular people in town. What do they do when the superhero comes to save the day, when the bad person comes? They all run. They're helpless. There's nothing they can do about it, and they need Superman or they need Batman to show up and save them. That isn't the way that it is. We have the power. We were given the power when our forefathers fought and died for our right to vote. We are the superheroes. The ballot is our superpower. And if you want to make change, you can do it. You can make change as a young person, and we need more people out there that are willing to stand up for their rights and do something. Make change. There's a lot of people who really wish that they could do it, and they have passion in their hearts for it. But you have to stand up and say, yes, I can. I will do that. So. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Andy Schuler. Uh, I ran for Golden Valley City Council last year which is a nonpartisan race. So I felt uh, the liberty to seek endorsements from a few minor parties, uh, Legal Marijuana Now, uh, the Green Party, which I'm representing today, and the Ecology Democracy Party, which I'll be showing you a cartoon uh, right now. It's about proportional representation, which I pushed when I ran for city council. In 2013, the two winners got 17 and 21%. So talk about imbalanced representation. Oh, and this is narrated by Ken Pentel, who founded the Ecology Democracy Party. So let's clarify, right now, we have single member, winner take all districts. You just had two parties running and one party got 49% of the vote, 49% of the vote end up with zero representation. 49% of the people in that district do not have their values reflected in the government. And so right now, Minneapolis and St. Paul, if you look at the Minnesota House, 100% of the people elected from those regions, Minneapolis and St. Paul, are Democrats. Well, does that mean in Minneapolis and St. Paul there's no Republicans, there's no Greens, there's no Libertarians, there's no Socialists? Is that what they're saying? So we're not getting an accurate reflection from Minneapolis and St. Paul, and you could take that out to rural areas of the state. You could go to Carver County or other parts of Minnesota where it's 100% Republican in a huge area. And that's not honest. And so uh, what it does is proportional systems decentralize power, uh, you don't have to get a huge number to get a seat at the table, and you can vote more accurately with your values. And in that respect, uh, what we're looking at is a uh, situation where people are engaged in every proportional system in the world. You generally end up with about 75 to 95% turnout because people don't have to get a big number. You know, because what we have now is a situation where um, the dominant two parties create the illusion that we're reflecting the values of the culture. And so what they do is after each 10 years after the census, uh, where they lose the power of Democrats and Republicans, they read, uh, look, draw the lines for the districts. But they draw the lines where the voters basically, they see where the voters voted in the last election, and then they draw the lines to their advantage. But they establish these safe districts. And so in many respects, the dominant two parties are creating, uh, create, basically pick the voters in advance, creating the illusion that the voters are picking the candidates that are yeah. electing. It's a real trick in a way. It's not absolute. And there are close districts where there can be somewhat be considered democratic activity, but in a proportional system, you don't have to get a big number to get a seat, and you can refresh the system. The uh, other part of it, of course, is when you have these safe districts, then moneyed interests uh, <laughs> know exactly, almost a guaranteed outcome for them, because uh, they know exactly what they're dealing with. Um, and it gives them some sense of security when they invest in a candidate or a party. Uh, and so that creates predictability for those interests that are counter to the interests of what I consider democratic practices. Yeah. Thanks. That's a work in progress. I'm making a few of those, so uh, I hope you liked it. Good. Chris Bay. Can I go? Yeah. 
Um, thanks everyone for having me. My name's Chris Gray. I'm an organizer with Socialist Alternative. We've ran election campaigns in South Minneapolis and also in Seattle, where we elected the first open socialist as an independent to city council in 2013, a woman named Shama Sawant, who won 100,000 votes, um, received no money from corporations, and has pledged to use her um, campaign as a way to build social movements in the city of Seattle. After six months being elected in office, she helped pass a $15 minimum wage, making Seattle the highest minimum wage in the country, and has fought vigorously against rising rental uh, prices, which are a big deal in cities like Seattle and San Francisco, but also a big deal in cities like Minneapolis. Um, and so that's what I'm, I think, here for and to talk about a little bit, but I really appreciate what other folks have said on the panel so far. I live in South Minneapolis. Um, Minneapolis is effectively a one-party town. We have one Green Party city councilor, but the other 12 are Democrats. And I just think it's really important for us to reflect on the legacy of that because often it is true on a presidential election or statewide election, we're told you have to elect Democrats because if you don't, the Republicans will get in charge or vice versa, depending on what your background is. But in Minneapolis, it's very clear that the Democratic Party is deeply tied to big business and that fundamentally at the end of the day, maybe they say nicer things to people, but they will represent the interests of big business. In Minneapolis, they're more than happy to give out subsidies for a stadium and have ordinary people pay for it with a sales tax. But city council is completely ineffective at challenging big business, fighting for a minimum wage increase, um, fighting for more affordable housing in the city and a whole host of other policies. It's a Democratic Party run city which presides over the worst racial inequalities in the country. That's the legacy of the Democratic Party in Minneapolis and Betsy Hodges. The Democratic Party is completely ineffective at challenging the Minneapolis Police Department, although its union head or federation head is a widely known, um, widely believed to be a racist. Um, they refuse to carry out any reforms. That's the legacy of the Democratic Party, and I agree with many of the panelists that fundamentally our two-party system is built to reflect the interests of big business and, um, ahead of the interests of ordinary people. I just want to talk about how we can change that a little bit. I think um, we should start with Bernie Sanders' campaign and just recognize that it is unprecedented that a self-described socialist won in a, in a state like Oklahoma, also in Minnesota, and that's profound. And just to look at what Bernie Sanders' strengths are compared to the other candidates, I think, is Bernie Sanders starts from the needs of ordinary people, which are so often neglected um, in Washington or even at a state level or a city level. He starts by talking about how do we provide good jobs, a quality living, adequate health care, how do we change global warming and prevent fossil fuels. Um, his starting point is very different than politicians typically associated with the two-party system. Bernie Sanders raised a competitive amount of money to Hillary Clinton based on or, uh, small donations from ordinary people, averaging around $27. I think what that shows for us is that as third party candidates or people interested in independent politics, that we can be viable and that working people have a powerful collective power if we organize and use it. I think the Sanders campaign reflects that. I also think that the Sanders campaign reflects a deep change in US society, where young people under the age of 30 prefer the word socialism to the word capitalism now. And I think there's an honesty to that. I'm 32, and I grew up um, hearing that capitalism was the dominant global system. The history is over, and now um, we're moving on. What if I, now I'm 30, <laughs> I learned that in first grade. We're still cutting down rainforests. We haven't changed over to green energy, even though it's very clear, there's a scientific consensus at this point, that we are heading towards global catastrophe if we continue to put carbon um, and other chemicals into the environment. Um, I learned that people should have a good job if they work hard and that they should be able to go to college, um, things like that. And I think more and more with rising student debt for young people, with a lack of quality jobs once you get out, um, people are becoming more and more um, disillusioned with what capitalism has to offer. The average job opening right now in Minnesota pays ten fifty an hour. Um, if you come out of college with student debt, it's almost impossible to pay that off. I think we need to fundamentally transform society. I think the force to do that is the collective power of working people. And so socialist alternative is maybe a little bit different um, in the sense that we think that to build independent politics that actually fights for the needs of ordinary people, we need to base our political um, party or candidates on social movements, um, that our party should be organized in the day-to-day -day struggles in Minneapolis where we live, fighting for a $15 minimum wage, fighting against police brutality at the fourth precinct, um, fighting against the stadium, 
We fought against foreclosures when we ran in 2013. Our candidate got arrested, Ty Moore, at a foreclosed homeowner's house. The reason that we did that is because fundamentally, I think social movements are what transforms US society. And I think history shows that time and time again, that um, all the things that we think of today as progressive victories, which weren't included in the Constitution, um, were won by ordinary people organizing and fighting back. That's how they took down Jim Crow. That's how women um, fought for access to abortion. It wasn't because the politicians just got together and said, now it's time to do the right thing. It's because ordinary people fought hard and asserted themselves over that political process. I think that's how we can build a viable third party. Um, I think what's necessary is for us to build a new party. I think Bernie Sanders shows that that's possible, that if you fight unapologetically for the issues of ordinary people, if you stand up for health care, access to Medicare, for free college, for quality housing, for an end to wars, um, that you can awaken and cut through voter apathy, that you can convince people that now is a time that they should fight back and that this is something worth fighting for. But I think in order to do that, you have to be very clear. We don't uh, support the Democratic Party. We think the Democratic Party is tied by a million threads to big business and that it will never become untied just on its own because it's the right thing to do. We refuse corporate money. We think that we need to take donations from ordinary people, base ourselves on social movements, and continue that fight. But I also think fundamentally that's not enough. We would go further than just having a voice in government. Um, I think fundamentally we need to transform our society. And when I say socialism, what I mean is democratic control of the economy. That why is it that maybe you can vote for a politician every four years, but you can't vote on how your energy is produced, or you can't vote on how your tuition is paid for. Um, that's capitalism. I think socialism offers an alternative where we can really live in with liberty and equality and peace. Um, I agree with that philosophy, but I think that's entirely unachievable when we live in a world where 62 people or families own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the world combined. Just imagine that for a second. On a bus, <laughs> you could fit, enough, like the amount of people that can fit on a bus, they own as much wealth as the lowest 50% three and a half billion people, four billion people, something like that. We live in the most vastly unequal societies in human history. It's not gonna change itself just because it's the right thing to do. What history shows time and time again is that the way to transform something like this is for ordinary people to get together, to fight for their own interest, to organize on the streets, in their workplaces, at their schools, and then also to run candidates to make sure that our movements can get their demands into the political arena, which I agree often ignores the basic interests of ordinary people. Thank you. Hi, I want to thank uh, the departments. I want to thank students for being here. And I want to thank my uh, brothers and sisters from the uh, other third parties. I'm Oliver Steinberg. I'm the uh, theoretician and chief bore of the uh, Minnesota Grassroots Legalized Cannabis Party. And uh, doesn't mean I'm not interested in or participating in other political activities. My wife and I went to the um, Cluster Caucus the other night, and uh, uh, I think it was really encouraging to see young people turning out, because the last one of the caucuses I went to, there wasn't anybody under the age of 50. Well, the Minnesota Grassroots Legalized Cannabis Party has been around since 1986. We're a protest party. We understand the historic role of third parties in America is to test to drive controversial reforms which the professional politicians are afraid of. And this is uh, the history of the abolition of slavery. They had the Liberty Party and the Free Soil Party before there was a major party that would stand up against slavery. Uh, there was a party called the uh, the People's Party, the Populist Party. In Minnesota, it was led by a tremendous uh, orator named Ignatius Donnelly. And they advocated reforms that were thought to threaten civilization, like votes for women, and direct election of United States senators, and getting money out of politics. Well, they didn't succeed on anything, but some of those reforms were adopted. And the reason that the professional politicians adopt these reforms is because 
they're afraid of the votes that go to the uh, dissident parties, the amateurs, the, the protesters, the, the people on the outside saying, we've had enough, we're fed up, you're not serving us, you're supposed to be serving the public and you're not. So, uh, 100 years ago, there was a socialist party in the United States and their candidate was Eugene Debs. He ran for president five times. The last time he ran, he was in Atlanta Penitentiary because he'd been put in prison for speaking for peace during World War I. And he got almost a million votes. The thing to do as a protest candidate, a protest party, Yes, you normally may not win the election, but you want to have an you make an impression here. You, you have a belief, a conviction, that what you're doing matters, it's important. And what we're doing is, in the grassroots party, is we're fighting for human rights. In the 1980s, instead of moving to end drug prohibition, which never worked, which I was just like alcohol prohibition, led to corruption, crime, uh, to the invasion of privacy and destruction of civil liberties. It, it, it led to a tremendous waste of taxpayers' money. And we saw then, in 1986 and 1990, we were writing about the racist roots of the drug war. Michelle Alexander has written a tremendous book called the New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. And what she said in this book published in 2010 is what I personally, in our party, was saying in 1986, in, in 1990, we could see what was happening with the grassroots party. The grassroots means the people who are farthest from the centers of political power. All the politicians want to go around saying, we're running a grassroots campaign. We're right down there listening to the plain common folks. Well, we are the grassroots party. We like that name. We hang on to it. Because roots means getting to the, the, to the uh, basis of the problem. And we saw drug prohibition. It's not just a question of some people like to get high on this, some people like to get high on that, and maybe they shouldn't do it. It's when the government tries to dictate to people what they can do in their personal private lives, it assumes the power of a police state. Now you have well, the war against drugs, you know, some drugs, was used to t uh, do two specific things. We could see it happening. To take away personal freedom and civil liberties. The Fourth Amendment is supposed to protect you from unreasonable search and seizures. It really doesn't exist anymore because of exceptions made in the name of chasing down the scourge of drugs. The other thing, besides providing a template for a police state, giving the police authorities the power and the technology to spy on everybody all the time so they can catch them, the other thing is it's was used to recreate a racial caste system in this country. It's a shame in the original sin of this country that it was stolen from the Indians and built with the labor of enslaved Africans. And this seems to be something we can't get over. I lived in the 60s. I heard Dr. King speak. I heard the, uh, uh, and witnessed the change of people as a popular, powerful movement of ordinary people can move us forward, you know, take down the signs that say white and colored. But the economic and social forces, and some of it is just plain old prejudice, that created a system of segregation, the old Jim Crow, lives on. And it lives on now in, this, in the disguise of mass incarceration and the punishment of people for something that shouldn't be a crime to begin with. Well, I've talked over my time, so I'll just say that in Colorado, in Oregon, states like that, the citizens have the right to petition to put the law itself up for a vote. And that is how, in most states, they've taken the steps to dismantle marijuana prohibition. And that will help to end the uh, intrusion of the government into people's lives, and it'll help to uh, uh, reduce the expense and, and the tragic human waste of incarceration. But Minnesota state constitution doesn't let us petition to put that on the ballot. And I'm glad this is a First Amendment 
forum because our, our platform is the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. One of the things is the right to petition for redress of grievances. That's in the First Amendment. And you're all welcome to sign this petition to Senator Frank and ask him to support Bernie Sanders' bill to legalize marijuana federally. Well, we don't wait for elections. We're active all the time. And we know there are many uh, connected causes of injustice. Uh, we ran as a grassroots party for over uh, 20 years, and then people said, well, you get lots of votes, you don't get elected, but you get 10, 30,000 votes in every election, nobody knows what you stand for. It's like, well, like we're the Republicans or the Democrats, they don't know what we stand for. We decided we put the words on the ballot. We can't put the law on the ballot, we can put the message on the ballot grassroots hyphen legalized cannabis. After all, the Democratic Farmer Labor Party has a hyphen. They, they're a combination of the old Farmer Labor Party, the great third party that ran this state during the Depression, and the Democratic Party, dating back to 1944. So we, we went on the ballot as the grassroots legalized cannabis party, and our candidate for state auditor got 55,000 votes, even though nobody, who sh nobody knew who she was. She was just on the ballot with the title. And our um, candidate for governor got over 30,000 votes. And other folks who thought they could do better, one man in particular said, well, I think it sh you've got the wrong name. You should call it legal and you're on now and see how many votes you can get there. And they, Running for Attorney General, totally unknown, Dan Fonchek got 57,000 votes. Not enough to win, but too many for the politicians to ignore for much longer. Thank you. Right. We also have uh, two political journalists that want to uh, give their insight. We want to hear their insight on it. So, Christy, if I'd, uh, Ms. Christy Marone from the St. Cloud Times. Um, what do you see as the media's role in some of the issues that you're, you're hearing? From these, from these representatives. Yeah, um, this is really very interesting, I think, for us as journalists to listen to this. Um, I cover government and politics for the St. Cloud Times. Been doing that for a while, um, and I did cover the Minnesota legislature for about three years from 2002 to 2004. Um, so I got to see the tail end of Governor Jesse Ventura, um, and I have a very clear memory of coming to this campus. Um, it was about three days before the uh, 1998 election, and um, he came, he stopped here for a campaign stop shortly before the election, and there was like 300 college students who came to see him on a Saturday morning. I mean, 300 on a Saturday morning, that's pretty impressive <laughs> at a college. Um, and. I was standing there listening to him speak, and he said, I, we are going to shock the world on Tuesday, and people were cheering, and I thought, this guy really might win, and <laughs> he did shock the world that Tuesday, so it showed that third-party candidates can win, but, you know, not everyone is Jesse Ventura, and I think... Um, it, it's interesting for us as media because we folk, you know, the media tends to focus on the winners and for a lot of reasons, but I mean, part of it is we think that's what people care about um, and we think they're not interested in the minutia of the, the primary and the caucus system and how delegates are awarded and everything. So we kind of fo focus on the horse race. Um, it makes it very difficult for the public to learn about other candidates and the issues that they care about and um, you know who they are so I think um, part of the problem I mean in Minnesota we use proportional representation to determine um, delegates but I don't think that everyone is always aware of that so we focus on the winners even though um, delegates are awarded um, based on you know um, the the number of votes so who won or lost um, in a smaller state isn't maybe as important as the overall delegate count, and that sometimes gets lost. Um, but most people find these kind of electoral rules pretty dull and tedious, so the media kind of shies away from trying to explain those. Um, it's much more exciting, frankly, um, to focus on who won or lost, and we're seeing that right now nationally. Um, and what we end up with is this never-ending campaign, uh, cover, cam campaign coverage that, that focuses on who's up, who's down, who's got traction, who's got momentum, um, and ignoring the other candidates. So I, I think of people like um, John Kasich or you know Martin O'Malley, who just you know really c could could the average voter really tell you what 
what they stand for, what who they are, you know, what what issues they care about. I, I don't think they're getting the traction that that they'd like to see. So. Um, the average reader or viewer can come away from all of this thinking that there's only one or two candidates that really matter and they'll be throwing away their vote if they if they vote for anybody else. Um, I think that um, in many newsrooms, and we're like many newsrooms, I think Tim would say the same thing, we've had to downsize staff in recent years and it makes it really difficult to do those more in-depth issue kinds of stories that take longer. Um, you know, you, we're, we're all limited. We, uh, we don't cover the Capitol full-time anymore like we used to, the, the Minnesota Capitol. Um, nationally, you know, a lot of media organizations have cut back on their coverage, so um, it's, it's a lot easier just to focus on who's winning or losing than to do those more in-depth kind of issue stories. Um, but I think that if, you know, if Americans don't understand our, our primary and caucus system that we, that we use to choose presidential candidates, that's partly the media's fault. And um, I think we need to kind of go back to the basics and explain some of this stuff every four years. Um, we just did, the, last week we did kind of a, an explainer piece about you know, what is a caucus and what are, you know, how do you participate if you've never gone before? What should you expect? Where to find your caucus? And it got really good traction from readers. I spent most of Tuesday taking phone calls from people who said, what is this caucus thing and where do I go? And I helped them look up there <laughs> where to go. I mean, I, I just think there's a lot of people out there who have never gotten involved. I mean, I think uh, average like 2% of Minnesotans participate in the caucuses, precinct level. So um, a lot of people just haven't been involved in the past and we've sort of called it this, you know, something that only party activists attend and go to and maybe, you know, we can all play a role in, in trying to change that and letting people get involved earlier in the process. So um, I think that it, it's important for you all too to, as consumers of media, to seek out those other you know, types of stories that are, are more than just the horse race, who's up, who's down. Tim Hanniger, yeah, I'll ask you the same question. I know your your newspaper has recently editorialized or has editorials in support of the ranked choice voting. Is yeah. that correct? Um, yeah, my name's Tim Hanniger. I'm the managing editor of the Monticello Times. We're a weekly newspaper, but our parent company is ECM Publishers, and we have 50 weekly newspapers throughout the state. I have sat on that company's editorial board, and that's 9 to 13 people. Uh, it's representative of managing editors, people throughout the company, and we bring all the candidates in. Um, two years ago, we, our editorial board said, look, let's give rank, voice, rank choice voting a try locally. Um, you know, we said, look, this is going to run in all our newspapers. Um, we endorsed it as an editorial board. Um, we found it interesting, I found it interesting though, last month in Brooklyn Park, their council turned down rank choice voting. They put it up. And Andy knows what I'm talking about. And I thought, of all the places where you could probably have made a huge breakthrough with ranked choice would have been Brooklyn Park because of the demographics, the change that's happened there. I mean, you look what goes on representatively there. And it didn't get the traction. But we looked at it. Our publisher explained it to us. And if you can have a bunch of journalists learn about ranked choice voting in an editorial board meeting and come away, and he did it in about 25 minutes. It can bring change, and it probably will bring change. Um, you know, one thing, I was off this week. I didn't have, I had vacation this week. I needed to take it. And I thought, everybody asked me, well, aren't you going to be out on Super Tuesday? Aren't you going to be out? And I thought, well, you know, I got to take vacation. And I was going to just sort of slide in and make a visit. And I said, you know what? I want to step two steps back and Wednesday morning look at it. And it's unbelievable the engagement we're going to see from the demographic in this room. These people, we need to thank these people because having this third party alternative is extremely important. And yes, we as all types of media need to do a better job explaining, having you come in, talk to our editorial board. Um, you know, one thing, I'm off it right now, but I think I'm going to get put back on it because. Julian Anderson, who is Elmer Anderson's son, said, I kind of like to have you around when it's election time. Um, just really, really interesting what's going to happen. You know, I try to think of a historical parallel, and I see a few students of mine in the room. They know I love to bring movie analogies up. Forty years ago, there was a movie called Network. 
Peter Finch. He played, net, he played anchorman Howard Beale. And what did Howard Beale say? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. And he got everybody to jump out their window. You know what? I think it's time we all get mad as hell, but we think about it. We need to do a better job of explaining that anger. We saw it at our newspaper convention. We talked about it. I think I sat, I sat on a political panel there. It was a political boot camp. It was people like Bill Hanna, who works up on the range. And we said, it's coming. It's coming. We had no idea that Tuesday was going to bring what it did. Uh, her paper had a great photo of Apollo High School. You want to look at demographical change in, Ohio, in, 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 this, in this town, Apollo is it. The people were stacked 12 deep. That's good. We need engagement. Um, yeah, we looked at ranked choice. I think we'll probably look at it again and put it back up for endorsement. But please remember, there's alternatives. And you're open-minded here. And that's the best part about being on a uni university in a presidential election year. You can do anything you want with your vote. Just be educated. So one of the things listening to uh, everyone here, and I'm glad I brought up ranked choice ordering from the beginning because that's uh, one thing that I know some communities have experimented with and with good success. I'm wondering if if any of you have thought about what might be the, uh, the changes that would come to funding of campaigns if we change the rules of our elections, because right now there's so much money in politics, and one of the obstacles I think that third parties face is that people don't want to give money to a campaign that they feel doesn't have a chance. And you know, you talked about the voting dilemma that, that people say is, well, gosh, if I don't vote for this candidate, then the worst candidate's going to win. What about the effect on funding as well? Because I think that's a big obstacle. Do you think that if we make these changes to some of the electoral rules, that that's actually going to break up sort of the monopoly or the duopoly that the two major parties have on this? Yes. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because Minnesota actually has a great thing, uh, public funded election campaigns. We have a process in law on the books that was used for many years by which citizens could make a donation of up to $50 to a political candidate of any qualified political party, both the major parties and the minor parties. And this meant that a supporter could give us a check for $50. And then they would be reimbursed from the state election campaign fund. This enabled us, the grassroots party, without any rich uh, uh, angel or sponsor, to run candidates year after year, get the, uh, the uh, message that we had out to the voters. And we don't care if they don't get elected, because we're talking about getting a message out there that we want the other people to come along and swipe. Now, all the other minor parties here have picked up on the idea of ending prohibition. So we just have to get the Democrats and Republicans aboard, and they're coming along uh, slowly. So what happened with the funding? Under Governor Pawlenty, the governor unilaterally shut down the law. He said, we're not going to hand out checks from the state election campaign fund. So when Governor Dayton took over, the DFL said, oh, well, we'll put that back in place. It lasted for two years. And then when the 2014 votes were counted, and there was two parties that explicitly in their names said legalize. There was legal marijuana now and grassroots legalized cannabis. The legislature suspended the public financing of the campaign. So uh, we couldn't get the money. We'll go on any, they can't stop us by taking the money away. But I thought it was significant that uh, uh, when we reached the point where we could become, uh, you know, bring our issue into the mainstream and have a, a basic funding, you know, Bernie Sanders shows. If people believe in you, they will give you the money. Whether you're supposed, nobody said Sanders would ever have a chance to get anywhere in this election. But uh, because he's speaking to the people, they hear what he says, and it makes sense to them. They'll invest in it. So, uh, yeah, money has corrupted our system, but um, 
we persevere. Yeah, no, and I just wanted to add that at the end of the last session, the Republicans had it in their platform to save the, I don't know what, maybe, how much is the political contribution refund program in a budget? It's like, you know, a couple million or something like that. It's not well, a lot it's of money. It's 3000 to us. Yeah, right. But the de Republicans wanted in the Minnesota House to save money and not have it anymore. And when they went to a conference committee in the end, the Democratic Senate figured, you know, those third parties out there, they're the ones that uh, really are going to benefit, so we'll give up on that. And they caved into the Republicans on that issue. I don't know how many of you know about the Citizens United uh, decision, right? How many out there, you know, that the United States Supreme Court said that corporations are people, and therefore they have the free speech under the Constitution right to spend unlimited amounts of money anonymously for anybody they want. And we got to get rid of that decision as part of what we got to do for change. I'd like, you know, can I just, uh, all of you out there, this ain't going to happen unless some of you guys get excited about it. How do you feel about politics? Are you here because you got a course that you got to be here for? Are you, in, are you willing to become activists? We need you guys to take the torch and run with it. G give me your opinion on politics. Somebody say what they feel. Hey, there's a mic there. They can go up and ask a question. So, it just one of you, do you think that politics is worth it or not worth it? That's simple a question. You guys, as millennials, how do you feel about how things are right now? Like, let's let's hear. It. Let's. I want to know how you feel about our political system. You know, is it worth it to be a third party candidate? Do you have that passion in your heart to make something happen? Or even a other party, major or party. Any other party. Or do you feel represented? Yeah. I guess um, the only thing I really have to say is I'm 26 and I haven't voted, not because I don't think voting is not important, but because I haven't found an election where I think somebody is properly representing me. Yeah. Um, I guess the first time I was able to vote, it was 2008, I think. So that would have been Obama's first like election, and I didn't think him or, um, was it Ron? McCain. 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 McCain, yeah. I didn't think either of them really represented what I wanted to be able to vote for. And I just, I was really looking for somebody to come up from somewhere and be like, you know, I agree, or I want to be able to be like, I agree with them on their financial like policies and their social policies, and neither of them fit what I was looking for. But do you think if, most people are like you? The, uh, there were six other candidates on the ballot. Maybe one of them could have been the voice for you, and a vote for one of them is just as important and counts just as much as a vote for the one of the big two. So if you make that vote for somebody else, but it's up to the media to, and to yourself as a citizen to be able to find out who those other folks are. Uh, but there, that's the whole idea. We petition and work hard to get on the ballot so that when the time comes, you do have more choices, and you can make the point you want to make. There's a smorgasbord of candidates. Yeah, I'd like to speak to that, though, as far as process goes. Is there, there are websites out there. Isidewith.com is a good resource for finding a candidate that you agree with, and they cover candidates all across the spectrum. They include third-party candidates as well as Republicans and Democrats. And so you can you know, go through their questionnaire and give them your opinion on everything. Tell them how important it is or less important to you, and then they'll come up with a candidate and tell you like by percent how much you agree with that individual. So that's a good resource for you. But also, I wanted to address the idea of throwing your vote away because in, in a lot of states, so the state of Minnesota, the electoral college is actually who decides in the presidential election, that's who decides our presidential candidate. So we have 10, ten electoral votes, and those electors go, and usually, and so since 1972, that's the only time we've had another party other than the Democrat Party represent the state of Minnesota. We are not a swing state. So unless the person that you're, unless you're afraid the Democrat isn't going to win, you can do whatever you want, because in Minnesota, Every time, it's always going to be the Democrat Electoral College. So as far as throwing your vote away, if you vote for a Republican in Minnesota, you're throwing your vote away. If you vote for anyone, it's not unless it's the Democrat, you, we already know it's decided. And it's not even close. I mean, last time, they always act like it's close because the media covers the horse race, and they got to get people to pay attention. So they've got to be like, who's it going to be? Is Mitt Romney going to take Minnesota? And no, he didn't. And it was like 10%, OK? It wasn't even close. Swing states 
seats are less than 6% margins, and we are not that. So unless you're going to vote Democrat, really do whatever you want. Feel free. There's no such thing. They're all thrown away votes. Let, let me also speak to that as well, because um, I think er the focus on the national politics is a big mistake I think that young people make, is that I don't like any of these bozos running for president, so I have no reason to vote. The most of the most impact that you're going to feel in government is at the local level, at the lower level. And when you don't vote for president, you're also not voting for those other races that will matter to you at the local level. So there's a lot of issues that will matter. And that's where a lot of these candidates actually have a legitimate chance to make some noise is at that local level. So when you're not happy with the candidates at the presidential level, you can write in somebody like you know, none of the above, or Mickey Mouse. You know, when Arnold Schwarzenegger in California, I was in California for 10 years, when he was elected governor, I think Mickey Mouse got like 5% of the vote. So, I mean, that'll tell you something about the, 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 the choices that they had. So it's better to express your discontent by showing up, because if you don't, nobody, if you say, I don't like Trump or Clinton and I don't show up, neither of them is going to wake up in the morning and say, wow, man, those young voters, they really taught me a lesson. They didn't show up. Uh, they're not going to have their feelings hurt. They're just going to say, Say, wow, you know, young people don't vote. And so we don't need to listen to them. We don't have to care about student loan debt. We don't have to care about the issues that matter to young people, jobs, and, and all of this, because they're going to assume and interpret that as that, that you don't care. So I think it's important to show up, even if you don't want to vote for any of those candidates. You can make another choice. As they mentioned, there were other candidates on the ballot. You could just choose one of them, or you could write in somebody that, you know, write in your own name for crying out loud. We, you, you could be a good candidate. That's so. why I ran for city council real quick is because, uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't even care who's president anymore. I didn't vote when I was 18 uh, in 2000. It was Gore Bush. I hadn't heard of Nader at the time. And then later on, they blamed Nader. And I, and I said, but I stayed home because I hadn't heard of Nader. Had I, I would have gone and wasted my vote for Nader. So that's what kind of got me going. I was like, okay, you guys are just blaming these third party dudes when really, you know, you're the ones not appealing to people like us. So, and then eventually, yeah, I just ran for city council because that's where people really pay attention. Like, I mean, I was invited to the forums and I was able to go on public access and, you know, I got like 8.3%, which isn't much, but you only need, like I said earlier, the guy won was 17% in 2013, so it's, you know, it can make a difference on all of the levels. In this district, the race for uh, state legislature, it was decided by 69 votes. If two of my classes had showed up and voted for the other guy, we'd have a different state representative. That is a tremendously slim margin of victory. So, uh, it, it, I mean, even at the state level, your vote is, is making a difference. And the national politics is just the focus of the national media, and that's what captures the attention. And one thing, um, one thing that I would say, I mean, one of our core beliefs is that the politics should be as close to the people as possible. So we think that the federal government should stop doing what the state government should do, the state government should stop doing what the local government should do, and the local government should stop doing what the people can do. So the closer that you're talking to a person, I mean, talking to city council and mayor, you can actually personally connect with these people. The people running for president, like you said, I mean, they're so far removed from us, we can't really impact that. Um, in the state of Minnesota, Libertarian Party has six elected officials. Uh, five of them are on city councils and one school board. And that's because they're nonpartisan races and you can actually go door to door and meet with people and talk about the actual issues and it's a person to person conversation. You know, when we ran for Lieutenant Governor, I'm sure Hannah had the same thing when she ran for Governor. If there's three million voters, you can't go door to door and so it becomes the machine that gets you elected and it's the D or the R and we really struggle to even get on that, on that screen. And then there's a 5% threshold to be considered a major party. And if you don't hit that, then there's all these different access points that just magically go away. So, you know, we on this stage all get two to three to four percent of the vote and just barely miss it. Third parties together are 12 to 15 percent of the representation, but we get zero seats at the table. So that's that's a problem. I got another question for the student body out there. So how many of you have listened to enough today that if your candidate for the state legislature showed up at your door and asked for your vote, would you ask that him or her, where do you stand on ranked choice voting? Have you heard enough today to think that that's an important enough issue to ask the candidate about? And if they say, well, I don't like it, well, then I'm probably not going to vote for you. How many of you would feel that way right now? How many, can I see? How many of you think that that's an important thing? You think, yeah, good, good. We've started. Keep talking. Keep doing it. we got to build. I'm making cartoons to try and get people interested in this boring stuff. Well, and can I just add to, um, I just wanted to add one thing. I mean, you were talking earlier about how we have sort of a winner-take-all system, and, th you know, that's why you see two parties that are dominant. I think, uh, not to say that none of the third-party candidates can ever get elected to an office, but part, I think part of the role of a 
third parties to bring issues that they're not hearing the major candi party candidates address, bring those to the surface, and if enough people pay attention, then a lot of times those ideas are sort of co-opted by the major party candidates. I mean, you look at like Ross Pro or someone like that who really kind of changed the focus of the debate, um, you know, the year that he ran, did so well. And um, so, I mean, that, you know, maybe whereas if you only end up with 8%, but you were able to kind of get you know, get your issue out there and get it addressed, you know, it, it's not necessarily a wasted vote. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a great point because, I mean, obviously we're political parties, we're trying to get people elected, but we're also just trying to uh, send that message and communicate that message. So, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, legalizing marijuana and we all support that. Um, if it's a Democrat that brings that up and, and gets it passed, I think that's fantastic because that's progress that we want to see. And if it wasn't a Libertarian or Independence or Green Party person that did it, I don't care. I mean, we don't want the power, we just want the improvements. So all of our positions, if some other major party would pick those up and run with them, that'd be great. Uh, we'd still have the issue of the money in politics and the power and the influence and all those types of things. But if our issues get pushed forward, I don't care who does it. Those improvements will happen faster if you withhold your vote until you hear what you want and vote for a third party candidate if you're not hearing what you want. Yep. Yeah, and your vote means so much more to a third party candidate than it does to a Republican or Democrat because 5% is a game changer. 5% means they get major party status in the state of Minnesota. So that's what, you know, that's the prize. 5% is awesome to a third party candidate. So in other words, your vote is so much more powerful when you choose to give it to one of those minor parties. If it does end up being Clinton and Trump in November, <laughs> I would please ask everyone in this room to be educated about what you are going to see on the television, on the internet, because they are going to pull historical images out of places you're not going to believe. Be educated. But those people exist inside the Beltway. Washington is like its own theme park, all right? These I like this approach of local. Go local because it's where the decisions are made about roads, taxes, education. Education is such a huge local issue with school funding and you know, government mandates and special education. You can make the difference by just saying, I want to get involved. Walk to your city hall or your school board and start talking to them. Tuesday night is a good thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's just refreshing to see it's going to happen. There, there's energy. I, mean, I don't want to call it anger anymore. I think it should be called energy. And we need to explain that in the media. Her teams did a great job on Tuesday night. They were everywhere. I mean, that was the fun part of not being on deadline on a Tuesday night. I could sit back and watch everybody else. But I'm going to have to jump back into it again. I cover the 6th District. Michelle Bachman. I put up with Michelle Bachman for how many years? She never showed up at our editorial board meetings. We had to drag, push, cajole to get her there. And then she would cut out and she'd have to go to someplace else. That's what we deal with. We just want them to show up because we will not endorse in the races that we endorse with for our company on our editorial board unless they show up and put their butts in the chair and they talk to us. And uh, yeah, we, we endorsed Dayton. I was on the editorial board when we endorsed Dayton. I had the last question to Dayton. And I, asked governor, I asked him, sir, are you tough enough to be governor? Because he had a lot of issues. He didn't like the question. He got up in my face. He pointed his finger on my chest and he said, you better believe I'm tough enough. Mm. Well, maybe he is, I don't know. But that is our role. That is why we defend the First Amendment vigorously, and yes, all of you make a good point. We need to do a better job. It's hard. She's had budget cuts. I have had budget cuts. I basically have a sports person and myself to cover all the stuff that goes on around us. I'm lucky I have somebody young and enthusiastic. You are enthusiastic. Do you guys think that yeah. the major media, though, um, yeah. that's out there, the newspapers and the, the TV stations and everything, are they controlled by big entertainment dollars that sell advertising? Well, or? nationally. I mean, all you have to do is look at what Fox does. I mean, you can't even, I'm not even going to go there, but it's a good point. It's to the point where you'll look, I think there's an index of 50-year-old to 60-year-old some males who are alone and single. If they watch Fox too much, they go insane or they die in their house <laughs> because they're scared to death of what they're being told. And it's not vetted. Vet all the information that you can. Go to another source. Yeah. Read. I mean, 
find multiple sources. I mean, you can still find printed literature. It's great to find tables full of literature to read. Go to the internet. Go talk to people. Go attend. Go to the forums in your community and get engaged and march on St. Paul. I mean, we'll cover it. We'll be there. I mean, we have to be there. Yeah. Issue a press release because yeah. they're looking for news, so you can send it out. You know, have a press conference. Send a, send all the you know press. Well, a I ran for attorney general and I had all the goods on Lori Swanson, the incumbent Democrat, and I kept saying with my press releases, "Here's how we're going to slam her. Here's what she gets an F on." The press wouldn't buy the show. They didn't think I had a chance. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> all right, you for, know. For twenty March on the Capitol, April twentieth. Go to the Legal Marijuana Law website and check it out. <laughs> Going back to local issues, though, I mean, it is true that they're important because, you know, Chris, um, you know, from the Socialist Alternative, alternative um, Party brought up the Viking Stadium, and that's a really good point because polling found that 68% of, of Minnesotans wanted the Viking Stadium entirely privately funded entirely privately funded and yet somehow when our roads are in the worst shape that I've seen in my lifetime they got 600 million dollars out of us so you know clearly local issues are affecting us that's you know that's money that's desperately needed and yet it's not being spent where we need it it's spent being being spent on toys don't you think it's funny that we publicly fund private stadiums but privately fund public elections <laughs> so, um, rest of the students in St. Cloud, however many there are, are are they like you know your friends, mostly into politics or mostly not into politics? Mostly not. Mostly yeah. Not. What about if we start, if I started a, a pizza party? <laughs> well, they'd be they'd be really into that. So I should run <laughs> as a pizza party. Run, I, run, I, run as a pizza party and then turn it into politics, but have pizza at the meetings. Well, I don't you know. know. You, you gotta like, you gotta give them the best of both. You, like you gotta give them incentive. Yeah. I don't I don't think the problem's pizza. Um, I organize around minimum wage in Minneapolis. Often we're fighting for a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage. I work a lot with low wage workers there. Um, and it's very, very difficult to get low wage workers to actively participate in that campaign. The reason for that isn't because they disagree with 15. They disagree, they agree, they want 15. That's a good thing, it'll get their family out of poverty. But I think a harder argument is, why is this a useful, um, why is this useful for my time and energy? Why should I invest my very busy life in organizing a grassroots campaign for $15 an hour? I think fundamentally that's the question. When we look at things like, why are voters apathetic? Why don't they know about city politics? I didn't know anything about city politics until, until I did anti-foreclosure work in Minneapolis, and then I was forced to learn about it only because of what I was doing. And I didn't care before, um, and I had to go through that process. The reason I didn't care is because I was that even though the city politics affects me, there's really nothing I can do. It's a confusing process, and I'm busy, and I have a very busy life. Why go? I don't think that there's some sort of civic problem with ordinary people or young people, why they don't show up, and I don't accept that. I think fundamentally, we need to convince people as third parties that we can present politics differently and that we can get things done. And I think that when we present ourselves, like, what's our plan? What's the socialist plan? We're like, we're gonna get one person in office and then we're gonna make a lot of things happen. And you, in back, I think in a lot of, back of a lot of people's minds, they're like, well, how are you gonna make things happen? There's like 300 representatives at the state level and you're one. I think the way to answer that is that we need to do something fundamentally different. If I get elected to some office, which I'm not a candidate for a major office, my role there is not to dive into the nuances of the legislative process. My role is to use my position there as a mobilizing to tool to bring ordinary people into that process. And I like the idea of like, yeah, march and we'll do a press release. Imagine if one politician or called for a national day of action against climate change at the Senate, say, and said, I want 15 million people or 30 million people in the streets to address climate change. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to do. That would profoundly change the way the country works. That would profoundly change the way people perceive politics. They don't. And I think a lot of ordinary people and working class people are very, very skeptical of the notion of elect me and I will fight your fights for you. Because for years that logic hasn't worked and it hasn't delivered. And so as third party politicians or candidates or whatever, we need to be fundamentally different. We need to say our plan is different. We have a way to get around Republican obstruction. And in that sense, I really disagree that it's actually a strategic um, 
good idea to focus on local politics. I think it's true that you can get a lot done in local politics compared to national politics, but most ordinary people pay attention to national politics. People are talking about Bernie Sanders because it's a presidential election year. We want our voices in that debate, or I want my voice in that debate. I want a voice there that rejects the logic of what Hillary Clinton and maybe Donald Trump are putting forward, and that fights for something fundamentally different. So I do think it's crucial that we pay attention and get our voices into the national elections. I think the way to do that, though, is not through um, sneaking around the process. I think we need to build an unstoppable social movement united around different demands, bringing people together to assert ourselves over that process. That's when the corporate media or the media, whatever you want to call it, pays attention to you. That's how we get our voices heard, and I think that's the way that we can transform what's happening in this Two -thirds country. Two-thirds of you nodded your heads. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Two-thirds of you nodded your heads that, you know, no one's into politics out there. No one's really wanting to do politics. Why? What's going on? What, what is it that, that, why are people so tricky? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I've been uh, into this fighting against the system since the 60s. I was out there marching in, against uh, our war in Vietnam back then. Uh, you know, the corporations and all the money going into the system. I uh, voted for Ron Paul because Ron Paul was against the system. Now I'm against, uh, or now I'm here because of Bernie, Bernie Sanders or not any of these little issues, it's Bernie Sanders because he's all against those corporations, which I see as the core thing that's been running this whole system for years and years and years. I want to see some of those people go to jail. I can go to jail for having joined them. I think billionaires can go to jail for stealing billions of our dollars. You know, it's not happening. I'm here because of justice. Bernie Sanders was an in it. I probably did not vote at all. He is the only reason I'm there. I was at the caucuses on Tuesday. Uh, we won. I became a delegate. I'm a delegate. I'm I see, you know, I am a Democrat, I will say that right now, I see Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And Hillary Clinton has been in the political system for I don't know how long. She is controlled by corporations. Lord Lloyd Blankenfield from Goldman Sachs is basically working her mouth like a puppet every time she she talks. And I mean, you know, she can switch her policy, you know, whatever way she wants. She's never been consistent. I watched a video of 13 minutes of Hillary Clinton lying. Bernie Sanders has been consistent since the 1960s, and that's what I really respect. And he's looking out for people like us. Hillary Clinton just says that because she wants to be elected. And that really pisses me off. I'm loving it. Keep going. Somebody else. Go ahead. Good. Good. Use the microphone. <laughs> so, Ken, um, is this on? OK. So my name is Kier Martin. I was uh, the chair for the Zach Phelps campaign when he ran for legal marijuana now in February. And I just want to say more to the audience than anything that um, you guys, as political science majors, I'm guessing a lot of you are, in college right now, us millennials, I'm 20 years old, I'm not even going to college myself yet, I'm about to, uh, you, we need to get involved. This is our future. Politics to us means a lot of the time an old guy in his 70s in a suit in a room in a formal big building in the middle of a city. You know, like, it's not something that we go 
to on a daily basis. Like you don't go hang out with your friends and talk about politics most of the time. So we need to change that fundamentally for us and for our future. We need to get up and stand up and get involved because no one's going to do our future for us unless you want the 70 year old people to decide what you guys are gonna do in 20 years. We have to be the voice of change. We have to be the ones who stand up and say, look, we have creative ideas for how to make this different. We know how to make it work. We are sick of being told no by people older than us who already got the chance to do it. It's our time now to make the difference for our futures, for our kids that we're gonna have. And it's really not that hard to get involved. I've been involved in politics since I was 10 because I grew up with politics. I was always around it. My parents were talking about it. I got involved at a young age. but. I know people who don't get involved until they're 45 and they make a difference in the world. So if you are 20 or 30 years old or older or whatever, if you're old enough to vote, you can make a difference. Like when we ran a campaign, I had no idea how to run a campaign, but we stood up and did it. And it's, it's fun. It's not even that hard. Like going to the caucus on Tuesday, uh, like putting in a resolution sounds like a big deal. It sounds like it's really important and really tedious and hard. But putting in a resolution really just literally means writing down a sentence on a piece of paper and saying, hey, I think we should focus on this. And they go, yeah, we agree. And then it passes on to the next level. And so I passed a resolution to get $15 minimum wage and to get recreational marijuana in Minnesota legalized. And those both passed super easily because all you have to do is stand up and show up and do it. And we're the ones pushing for our future. We gotta do it. If we don't do it, nothing is going to change. It's better to show up than give up, as Bernie Sanders says. And yeah. Somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody else? Uh, Emma Goldman. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Emma Goldman, a famous anarchist and rabble rouser, once said that if voting changed anything, it would be illegal. And I think since she said that, it has been a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you look at this, all of you guys have great ideas and want to change everything for the better, yet you can't get elected to local. It's an uphill battle to get elected locally. But, so, but, but Derek, they are trying to make voting illegal all over again. Exactly. I remember when it was illegal for black people in the South to try to exercise their right to vote that they had on paper. But if they tried, they'd get killed. It's worth fighting for. That vote is worth something. They take it away from people when they're convicted of a crime. They take it away because it's worth something. they just as happy if you don't use it. What's that vote worth? Think about how much you paid in taxes last year, income tax and sales tax. That's the price tag on your vote. If you don't use it, somebody else will cheerfully spend it for you. Um, anyway, I just, I feel it's been a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're trying to repeal voting rights and they have successfully in a lot of southern states. Um, I, I think you all are great and have great ideas, but how do you think you're going to get this rolling and actually accomplish something and defeat the duopoly? Can I? Oh. I was going to say one thing. First. I mean, we do make incremental things on progress on issues, for example, gay marriage. So there's no libertarians elected to the national office. Since we were founded in 1971, uh, we were in support of gay marriage, actually getting government out of everybody's marriage, whether you're gay or straight. Um, but I mean, again, it's we've made progress on issues, and same thing with legalizing marijuana. Obviously, there's several states that have made that progress, and we're getting traction across the country, um, regardless of whether we're elected or not. So getting elected is important, but pushing that issues like we talked about before is very important also. So you know, we are happy that that is moving faster than our election process is moving, I guess I'd say. I would just. It's awesome to come up here and talk about Emma Goldman for a couple minutes. That's cool. Um, I agree with her. Um, I think what she meant by that was if you stay home and only vote, um, that it's not going to get you anywhere. I mean, she was talking at that time in reference to a small but militant labor movement in the United States specifically um, that was fighting for basic stuff on the workplace. Some of them were fighting for a fundamentally different society, and they were up against um, wild, wild odds, like, you know, the police, there, there was no labor laws, the police would just come shoot at you and hit you with things to make you go home if you went on strike. That's what Emma Goldman's context was. 
I really agree, though. I think, I think fundamentally what's transformed U.S. society, what's changed since 1776, um, has been ordinary people organizing movements and taking direct action to fight for their own interests. I think history shows that time and time again that that's what changes things. I also think, though, that it's a mistake to ignore the political process only because most people in the United States right now are not considering, like, should we go on strike to set, shut down our country or something like that? The, the elections are a major moment in US politics where ideas about what the next steps are are debated in front of millions of people on their television screens. In and of itself, I think that's an argument for why, for, for myself as a socialist, um, we should pay attention to elections. But I think fundamentally, um, yeah, Emma Goldman's right, that it's not just voting. And if you just vote once and go home for the next four years, Nothing's going to happen. Um, you need to be active and organized. I think fundamentally that's what changes things. I just think also that it's important for those movements to develop a voice in the electoral arena. One way to think of it is um, if the corporate, if the media is paying attention and they're having a debate on TV where millions of people are watching, I don't want to ignore that terrain. I want to be part of that terrain. And if that means jumping in a little bit to the electoral process, that's fundamental. But look at why, why is Bernie Sanders winning right now? Why is 15 popular? It's not because of Bernie Sanders. It's because fast food workers went on strike. Why is Bernie Sanders talking about getting rid of the criminal uh, the prison industrial complex? It's not because of Bernie Sanders. It's because of Black Lives Matter, taking action across the country in cities like Ferguson, critiquing um, what I think is a racist society. Um, why is Bernie Sanders talking about climate change? It's not because of Bernie Sanders. It's because people organized the largest demonstration in New York two years ago with millions of, uh, hundreds of thousands of people to protest climate change and around the world. Uh, uh, ordinary people are creating the space that Bernie Sanders is filling. Bernie Sanders is not creating the space on his own. He's filling a vacuum in politics. And so I think Emma Goldman's fundamentally right. Yeah. And I think that just goes to say that direct action is more important than voting. I, would, I, don't, I don't want to really argue about what's more important, but I would say that, I would like to say that don't underestimate what it takes to make change. Like, uh, you know, 60% of people don't vote. So sometimes it's more than that in council elections. So there's a small amount of people that are doing all this damage to the earth and to our society. So if we could just get a small amount of people who are, who are willing to do a little bit, they could make a huge change. I think there was a question here. <clears throat> Well, it's a question, but also uh, a statement. Um, I came with Chris Dock. I'm a libertarian. I'm the executive director. And I wanted to address two things because um, it kind of brought me into politics. Before I became a libertarian, at least officially, I would not vote because I didn't like the people running. Then I realized, wait a minute, do I want change? If you want change, I would vote just to vote against any incumbent. I didn't care who they were. I didn't know the people. I would go to vote just to vote the incumbent out. And I found out a lot of other people were doing the same thing. That's one way to do it. And the other thing is I moved into St. Paul, ran. I thought I was going to be a paper candidate. Nothing, no way I was going to do it. But I ran for the city council of St. Paul. And I found out that I was able to shape the debate. I was asking questions. And what you do when you run for office, especially local office, is you force the incumbent to show up and talk about what's important. So not only should you vote, but if you don't want to vote for someone you like or don't like, vote the incumbents out as one possibility. The other thing is run for office. Even if you have a snowball's chance of winning, you will shape the debate and you will make them show up and at least talk about the issues. That's my statement. Another student, come on. Somebody else. Why is politics so like, um, you know, you don't want to do it or be fired? It's not cool. It's so much hard work. Can I reframe this question? What would it take for politics to be something worth spending a lot of time on? Um, or changing things generally? What would it take for that, for you to like, be like, I'm gonna spend 30 hours a week fighting for this cause, whether it's politics or something else? We get rid of the campaign finance system. I think that would be it, because I feel like, you know, my vote's wasted because there's some rich billionaire out there, like from Goldman Sachs or Citibank or the Koch brothers or George Soros trying to, you know, sway the votes to who, whoever they want to win, and those are the ones who usually end up getting picked. So. Back to, I totally nodded my head when Scott said a lot of my friends didn't go out and um, go on and voice your opinions. Um, 
Um, hi, I'm Josie. How's it going? Um, um, I just have to say that I totally forgot what I was going to say, but um, it's it actually it really does. I feel like education is a big thing, and we all mentioned like be educated. If someone said, um, go out. If if Hillary, I think it was um, Monticello Times. Um, you said if it was Hillary and Trump voting, know who you're voting for. Be educated. I feel like a lot of times a lot of students don't want to go because I only know of the two big people that are being talked about. You know, the only two big people being talked about are in my classes, and people are getting angry at each other talking about it. It gets me frustrated, and people just get angry. And I feel like that's a lot of times why I feel like people don't want to go and vote. Maybe because yes, I don't feel like they're not representing what I think, and maybe I don't even know what they think. So I feel like a lot of it is education of what kids, it's too hard of work, you know, it's, it's a lot of that. Um, so I guess my kind of question to you guys, um, I first voted when I was a freshman in college, and that was two years ago, and it was for locally, kind of like um, who was running, you know, for state senate or something. Um, it was two years ago, I'm sorry. But, um, and I, I don't even know who was running, like I just voted, and, and then I looked afterwards um, who was, like, what they were representing. And it, it shows that us as college students have no idea unless we really take the effort to look into these things. So what's one way that you guys can come on and maybe go towards the millennials and say, how can you target our area to be more interested? I guess, I, I don't know, that's a question. I want people. I want this place filled. I'm up here, kind of, I'm glad you guys are here, but I really wish it were 200 people. What do we got to do to get 200 people to want to come and talk about politics? Hannah just did it. Did anybody watch what Hannah's been doing? She's going right out to the people that are talking. She's engaged. She's going right to people. That's what you guys are going to do. You go right to where you want to be. You can do that as students. Go have a conversation. I know the hardest thing in the world is to put the phone down. Okay, because I've almost hit six of you trying to drive around campus because you don't. <laughs> and I fear for your safety. I know you're probably doing something important. But the true conversation, we can have good political conversation, but it has to be done. The devices we have are the greatest tools we've ever probably had to relay information quickly. But when it gets down to it, and that's what caucus night was really about, you're going to sit down on a hard wooden chair that's probably cracked, and you're going to sit next to somebody, and you're going to talk. Keep talking. That's what we need to do. Keep talking. Um, I know one of the things that makes it a problem for the younger people to do it, talk about voting and politics and stuff, is we're not really exposed to it. At least where I grew up, politics was not something we were exposed to when we were little. It was something that we should avoid something that the adults and the big wigs in the 70 year olds should be talking about. And so we don't start talking about it until it's too late and it's something we need to be talking about. As college students, we need to be talking about our tuition, how we're not gonna be able to pay for it outside of college. And I think that we need to start exposing children early on, even if maybe they can't quite understand it yet, get them exposed to it and then by the time that they're old enough to do something about it, they have all the education and knowledge to do something about it. I think that's a good insight. And uh, I would also say we need to teach people how to talk about politics because the rhetoric right now, you mentioned too that your fellow classmates are yelling at each other and they're getting mad. And, you know, that's, I think, a big obstacle for many students to talk about politics because if I say something political, somebody might attack me or somebody might yell at me. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're pushing people out of the political system by judging their politics and making assumptions about what kind of person are they and you know well you're a bad person if you support that candidate and and that's really killing our politics because we're not having conversations and that's part of it I think part of it is we're in a new media era right now where people can anonymously fling insults at each other with no consequences or uh, repercussions and, and that's kind of what you said about talking face to face is a big difference and I think it's also why I really encourage my students not to watch television news at all <laughs> because 
that's about that excitement and entertainment of the fight and the conflict. It's like a boxing match. Whereas these people in the newspaper business have to write, they have to do research and do this story, and it has to have substance, and you're going to learn more. Newspapers are dying because nobody is paying for the subscription anymore. Well, reporters have to get paid. I mean, that's tragic when they talk about, you know, they don't have the staff that they used to have, and we are less informed. And I think a lot of what you see at the top of the ticket right now is because people are not informed. They're afraid to talk about politics until somebody gets them worked up and mad enough that they're going to go in a foaming frenzy to a rally and start shoving people and, and engaging in violence. It's a tragedy. So I, I think really if you want to talk politics, there's a way to talk about it that's um, open and, and respectful of other people. And if we can do that, more people will want to engage in it. More people will want to talk about it. And uh, that's a socialization thing, as you mentioned. If our parents would talk politics with us in a civil manner, if we, they would see us talking with people in a rational, adult manner, then maybe more young people would actually say, yeah, I, I have opinions and I'd like to talk about them without fear of getting yelled at or fear of getting ostracized or insulted. And I think that's, that's an important part of it. Yes, sir. Um. back voting for Ron Paul, you used to have uh, an office in the Atwood Center. I came over here to try and find the uh, political office and, and uh, there was nothing here. I asked information, they said, well, you gotta go to this website, you gotta do this. You kind of hid the whole political thing. A lot of the people during Jesse Ventura, and all that, I think the college has, has dropped down, uh, dropped, dropped the ball on uh, supporting students having a political office that they work out of in Atwood. I mean, it it just isn't here, and so I left, and I really not, didn't get any contact whatsoever with any of the students, and uh, it just didn't happen. You know, uh, I figured it was. Too much effort, and no longer is there anybody interested in it here. Yeah, and I'd say I mean, one thing probably from all of these parties' perspective. Thank you. It's it's really hard for us to find you. I mean, most of the people we talk to come to us. So if let's say 10% of your age group is into politics and makes the uh, you know takes the initiative to come talk to us, and then they'll self-select: Am I libertarian? Am I independent? Am I green? Am I socialist? Um, but for the 90% that aren't coming to us, it's really hard for us to figure out ways to find you. Um, I mean, in the old days, it was television and newspaper, and in the new age, you guys are consuming information in a totally different way. So we post things on Facebook on our website, and we all do this: you know, Facebook, website, Twitter. But unless you're already looking at that source, you're not going to find it. So if we post something that's fabulous that you love, you're never going to see it, and we don't really have a way to get that to you. Same thing with all the other parties. So I think that's one of our biggest struggles is how do we communicate to the people that aren't already looking at us? You know what I mean? And it's just, it's, it's an obstacle. And I, if I had the answer, we would have changed that. But um, like for your generation, it's just really hard to get information to you because you guys are proactively going and getting information which is a great thing, but we've got to figure out a way to get on your radar screen to even let you know what we're talking about. you got to pay Google. <laughs> right, that's the problem. Question, how many of you in this room have student debt? Okay, Any, what's the approach? Okay, just go down the line. Tell us what the third party might be able to do if you go state, whatever. Give, us some, give these folks some hope because it is tough for them. Right. There's no GI Bill. Like okay, good guys point. Have to, you know, now we should have a national service. That how about if I stood up and said I want to run for office, saying that every college student, every high school graduate, has to spend two years in service to America and service to their community, and then we pay for your college. That was the GI Bill. When guys went, my my dad was off in the war. He was able to get a house when he came back and go to college when he came back because he was in the war. Why can't we do that for everyone? Oh, it wasn't so much as a question, just what we're talking about right now is kind of right on the point where I think to many young people, especially college students, where they have so many things going on, it just seems extremely unaccessible, this whole political landscape, especially when talking about third parties. Um, 
So I don't really have an answer either, but that's really the key is to somehow find a way to make it really understandable and easy for everyone to yeah. find out what each party stands for and why we should care about them. Right. Well, I can say this, that uh, in the last 40 years, about 50% of all wildlife on Earth has been depleted, which makes me wonder if 100% will be gone in the next 40 years. So let's start voting Green Party. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I implore you guys, you know, it might, there's, there's this huge mystery sur surrounding the entire political world. I'm not a politician myself. I like to call myself a representative of my people because, you know, I, I, I'm not here, none of us on this stage here are doing what we're doing because we want the power or we want the fame. It's just because we care about our people. So what I encourage you to do actually is, you know, don't wait for us to come to you because we will. I mean, we'll have mailers. You know, we're, we're going to find ways to contact our people. But if you have passion about any subject, it doesn't matter what party it is, what your ideals are. If you have passion for that, go out there and actively find it. All of our parties, we have meetings every month at least once a month, a couple hours. And if you just come for a little bit and you sit down at one of these meetings, you will quickly realize that, you know, this isn't rocket science. I know I built rockets for the U.S. government before I started in politics. So this is something that, you know, even I didn't know anything about it when I started. But when you sit down and you, you know, get to meet these people, I met Oliver Steinberg. He was one of the first people that I met. And his dedication to our cause is unrivaled. And when you meet somebody like that with passion in their heart, and you have it yourself and you want to make change, it's just about connecting the dots. It's about finding the people that are already fighting that fight and finding out how you can get involved in it. Because you can. It's not hard. We're, we're getting near the end here. And um, I got a question for the media folks, actually. But you know, I think it's actually a question for the panel. So if all of us third parties get united and start thinking about strategy together a little bit, in Minnesota, when you get the 5% you get to be major party status. And if we get the $50 halos over the head to contribute again, that would entail you to that. There's a lot of other things that come. Maybe we could all work together to think about the next time for there's a statewide election, let's just have one of us parties run only one person instead of four of us running for governor. And on another party would take the attorney general slot. Another party would take the secretary of state slot. And we could get four parties that they all could make it five percent. Do you think that third parties could work together enough that we have enough agreement here, commonality that we uh, that we could try and do something like that? That's my question for the third parties. Yes, 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 yeah. What do you think? We can certainly. Yes, Hannah. Yes. Rank yeah. place voting, right? Uh, now, if we did that, would the media cover that as a big story? That's a hell of a strategy. It is. I mean, because you're going to place people, you're going to have movement. And you're going to take the new tools. You're going to take the social media tools. You're doing it already. They're game changers. It's just going to add to your level. I mean, I don't know. I, I would just say, I would go back to my editorial board, and I would say, look, we've got to get busy with this. We have to make sure that we cover it. And I'm going to ask them again. Let's go back to ranked choice voting for the endorsement again and look at it, because we did it two years ago. Let's see where it's at and review it again. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we are a fairly, um, we're, we're trying to reach out to people where they are at in terms of uh, the, what they are interested in. And what we hear is that millenni the millennial generation is not particularly interested in politics because you don't align with a party like previous generations. Um, but what I find is that you guys are all really interested in issues and things like climate change and uh, you know student debt and these issues that really hit home for you. So I mean, I know my editors, um, we are trying to get into the space where you guys are, which is not necessarily a print newspaper anymore. It's you know it's video it's 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 all digital it's you know Facebook it's social media it's you know Snapchat whatever we're trying to get into the space where you are and for for me as a reporter to make the argument to my editors that something is worth covering we have to feel like there's an audience for that and so um, you know maybe it's not the traditional um, Democrat Republican cast my vote that kind of traditional involvement in politics but it, if it's if there's interest there, we will write about it and we will cover it. 
Right, and so most of the focus in elections then is on the horse race, but you guys care about issues. I mean, you're not, you know, to say that you're not interested in politics sounds like you're not actually interested in anything going on in the world. Like, do you guys care about mass surveillance? Do you care about, you know, like Apple versus the FBI? Do you care about perpetual war? Do you care about, you know, like you guys, I, I would love to hear from you guys, what are your issues? Because I know you guys care about issues, right? Is anyone want to throw out what's your issue that you're passionate about? Because if you have an issue, you care about politics. Anyone? I saw some nodding. The white stocking cap, what was your Apple versus the FBI? Is that? Is uh, just deforestation and saving, like just saving our planet, um, becoming more eco-friendly and really uh, not just doing that in one aspect, but evolving our our country and our, I guess, our Earth, um, it, making it just something that is a part of our everyday lives. And I don't know, it's, I mean, it's scary when you think about it and when you hear about it. And I don't even... I, I can't say exactly what because I'm not, I don't know yet. I mean, I'm still looking into it and becoming more knowledgeable, but it, it, it scares me and it really gets me fired up and it makes me care a lot. And that's, I mean, I am here because of a class, but I could have gone to a different, um, a different lecture, sat in on a different meeting, but I chose this one because I do care and I'm, I'm 18 and I do want to vote and every person, every one of my friends that say, um, oh, I'm not going to vote. And I, I, I say, well, that your vote counts. And like, it's just one vote. And I say, well, th think about how many people say it's just one vote. That's a lot of votes. That's just one vote. So um, yeah, I guess that's my opinion. Yeah, so there's obviously a disconnect between the issues themselves and politics, because it seems like you guys do care about politics. It's just that you care about individual issues. Anyone else want to speak to an issue that you? Um, I was just going to say that I think my problem is is that I go back and forth on the same issue. I feel like I can fall on both sides at different points in my life or what I hear and what I learn. And as things change, more education comes out about certain topics. We don't know everything about everything right away. And so I feel that um, even if I hear people say stuff that I think is a really good idea, I feel like in sometimes a month or a week or a year, I can change my mind. And I feel like I don't really belong anywhere on any, you know, even the big parties or the third parties, I feel that a lot of people have a lot of really good ideas and I feel like I could pick every candidate for anything and say I like that idea, I like that idea, I like that idea. And then in a month or so I could go back and say, well, I like this idea now and I don't like that idea. And so I think I feel almost confused a little bit. And um, I didn't really grow up, um, you know, I, I ask my parents about political stuff every now and then. and. Um, oh, we don't really learn it in high school that much. Um, you learn about the old politics and how things are now, but you aren't really taught what everything means and, um, and why things are the way they are now and how you vote and how you learn about all that stuff. And you don't really learn about it in college either unless you're in a major where you're required to learn about that stuff. So I guess I feel uneducated and I don't want to sound lazy, but I don't feel like I have the time to go out and learn this stuff because I am a college student. I have so much other things going on in my life. and. The things you do learn about are from those, you know, big parties, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, because that's what's thrown at you, and so that's the only information you're absorbing. And so I guess I just feel confused more than anything, and there are things I'm passionate about, but I go back and forth all the time that I just feel like I don't really belong in any one spot. Yeah, and I would say that from a libertarian perspective, that's one of the reasons that we believe in a reduction of government, because then you can make those decisions at the personal level. So you don't have an entity above you saying, this is how it's got to be, right? You can make your own choice. And then if you get new information, if you change your mind, you have that choice to go, OK, I used to think this, now I think this. If somebody else is mandating what you think, now it's out of your control. So we totally understand that as you get more information, it's not like what you believe when you're 18 has to be what you believe when you're 50, or even when you're 18 to 19. So go consume the information, change your mind. But as long as somebody's not mandating that, no, 51% of the people said it's this, now I don't really care that you change your mind. You still have to do this. So that's the key for us is 
keep the freedom and flexibility with, at the personal level so you can do what, what's right for yourself at any given moment. Yeah, when you got, when you mentioned that when you were giving your speech, that actually did spark an interest within me because I thought that is something that I would like is kind of that own personal freedom. And I, you know, I'm 20 years old. This is going to be the first year I'm going to be able to vote for a presidential candidacy. And um, I feel that because I'm so young, I'm still learning things. I'm still trying to figure out what I want in my life. And you know, I don't have a family yet. I don't have you know any of that stuff yet. And maybe when I'm 35 years old and have a husband and children, what I'm going to want then is way different than what I want as a you know spunky little 20-year-old kid in college. So it is hard to decide. You know, what do I want my future to look like? What are those presidential candidates going to give me? And it is a big choice to make. And I feel a lot of pressure. You know, to make those decisions as a 20-year-old. You know, 18, 19, 20, 21-year-old. And I think um, it's hard to be confused and to be feel like you need to make those huge decisions at a young age. Yeah, and then if you look at it, so if you took a 20-year-old and a 70-year-old, 70-year-olds vote in a lot higher percentage. Mm -hmm. So that's who's driving the decision-making then. And so it is a 70-year-old that's making the decision for you. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we think this, the, the system should be. All right, I think we have to, uh, we're, we're, we've got the room until 6, so we got to vacate here. But first of all, let's thank our panelists for coming. Appreciate your time and energy coming here. Conversations can continue after. Thank all of you, too, for attending. Have a good evening.